Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to you all that have uh, chosen to attend our Trimble Geospatial webinar session today. Uh, it's uh, going to be an interesting topic, an interesting speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce Niels Erik Jurgensen. He is not only our Trimble eCognition dealer in Norway and Sweden, but he is also uh, the uh, owner of Terranor. And Terranor is uh, uh, an excellent company that has been specializing in a number of eCognition related applications uh, for quite a long time. And just a little bit of background on, on Niels, if I may. Uh, Niels is, uh, comes from a forestry background, but uh, is, has been using eCognition for a number of years and is, is quite familiar with object-based image analysis and, and image uh, processing techniques. Uh, Niels has worked with uh, GIS and remote sensing since 1985, so building on, on a great wealth of knowledge here. Uh, he has supported a, a number of agencies with survey software and trained a, a great deal of customers and staff on how to do efficient and, and correct uh, surveying and also uh, remote sensing processing um, with uh, software that, and techniques that he has developed in house at Terranor, as well as uh, uh, Trimble eCognition products. And uh, in the last, uh, Niels, how many, how many years have you been working in the in, in the seabed mapping uh, sector? Uh, uh, well, we've been since uh, 2011, I think. Okay, so since about 2011, Niels has been venturing into uh, various uh, elements of, of seabed uh, mapping and the, the detection of features on, on the sea floor uh, using uh, various acoustic data sets as well as optical data uh, collected from submersibles and has been involved in some exciting uh, projects uh, and around the, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea and in, in this region. He was also uh, speaking at a, at a conference recently and this is a, a version of, of the talk he gave at that conference uh, about processing uh, large sonar uh, data sets uh, with machine learning techniques uh, in our eCognition developer software. So it is uh, my great pleasure to hand over this presentation uh, to uh, Niels, and uh, he will uh, be presenting the, the, what the, he's been working on at Terranor. And if you have any questions during this webinar, uh, please feel free to use the question dialogue and submit these. We will be uh, um, fielding these questions as we go along. We will ans uh, ask questions during the webinar. We will also have about a 10-minute uh, Q&A session after the webinar for, for questions and answers. Um, everybody is in listen-only mode. There's nothing wrong with your, your microphone. So uh, if you want to interact with us, please reach out via the, the question dialogue. And uh, lastly, uh, before I hand it over to Niels, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if uh, something went by you pretty quickly, uh, do not worry. You can access this in the Trimble Geospatial Webinars archive after uh, we've completed the, the session today. That being said, uh, Niels, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, from my side for taking the time from your busy schedule to uh, to do this presentation. And uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, and I will go into listen mode myself. Okay, thank you, Keith. Good morning, world. Uh, I know you're uh, around the cloud and uh, some of you have the morning, some of you afternoon, and some of the middle of the day, maybe someone middle of the night. So we're going to talk something uh, we find very, very interesting. And like the kid says, it's a, a way to analyze large sonar data sets with the machine learning algorithms. Um, it doesn't say here, but it's in e-cognition. And from a sales point of view, like the kid mentioned that I'm a sales representative for uh, e-cognition. Uh, the sales point here is will be process your analysis in shorter time with better quality control. And I'm going to seriously come back to this and um, how this works. First, we will, um, this is a follow up on um, the last webinar that uh, Trimble had once month ago with the Chris Rolsema from uh, Down Under, uh, Australia. The coral reef and seagrass habitat mapping using object based analysis. He was using a satellite and aerial and drone data for this. 
uh, this is quite different because we're going to work with sonar, which is a quite a different uh, type of data set. But we're going to probably do it very much the same way as he, he did. This method we're going to talk about today was created by CFAS and Norwegian Geological Survey a couple of years ago. It was presented at GeoHub, it's an international research conference, in Winchester, where we had about 70 research institutes uh, participate in that at, uh, training there. This uh, method that was uh, de de designed by CFAS and Norwegian Geological Survey, Terranor has modified it and automated the model to utilize ecognition machine learning algorithms. And for this work, we want to thank especially Dr. Marcus Diesing and senior geologist Tadja Tosnes, both work now at Norwegian Geological Survey. A little bit uh, where in the world we are. This you see here is <coughs> Norway. The survey area is from the Barents Sea up north. If you see my pointer, the North Pole is just up here. Um, the long country here is Norway. And the survey here is what some of the places are in the Barents Sea and some was in the North Sea. And the reason for that is the Norwegian oil industries pays for Norwegian oceanographic mapping. We're one of the world's largest supplier of gas and oil. And um, we need a, and all the oil we take out, we take out from the seabed out in the ocean. So we need a lot of good mapping in the ocean and a lot of survey companies around the world work in this area with us. And yesterday I had a different work with the uh, Ecognition helping an oil company taking uh, laboratory images of rock samples to analyze. It just shows that we can go anything from satellite to seabed to uh, laboratory images. I'm sitting here at, uh, just outside Oslo in the middle of the forest. And the reason for that is not this because I'm a forester, but it's close to the airport. And if you see down here, you'll find the cognition team with Keith Peterson and Christian Weiser, uh, with whom we have worked a lot with this uh, project, actually. They helped us a lot. Uh, we're small companies. We work very closely with the cognition team, and they have some really superb uh, people working in Munich. Let's see how we started with the seabed mapping some years ago. We were approached by a company called Lindin. They had about one million images they uh, didn't know how to do with. And if you've been working with images taken on the seabed, especially in the North Sea, not like the images you saw last month, because this is taken on uh, maybe from 100 meters down to a couple of thousand meters, and it's very dark down there. So we use artificial light. So you see up here, the image up to the left is uh, very uh, taken with the AUV from uh, called Hugen from Kongsberg. And you see the light is very central um, and dark to the sides. And we want to analyze this in e-cognition. No, I couldn't do that. So what we had to do is to create a software to actually balance out the light in in the image so it looks to the right so these two images are the same and you can see uh, the difference of the two images uh, quite clearly we also work with the uh, color images not only black and white because uh, new sensors um, in these AUVs and ROVs are now uh, in color and they have the light is starting to get better but what we see is that uh, one of the problems working on the seabed is, um, first of all, uh, it's difficult to have people down there. It's too expensive. So we send down either uh, submarines, uh, AUVs without people in it, or ROVs. And then we see that uh, the differences, the problems is that the light is captured uh, by the water and not given back to the camera. So you see how we can then try to improve the quality. And this looking at quality and to get a make good balanced quality, is something that we're gonna talk about with the sonar data as well. By using our software for image handling, we can increase the data with 
10 to 20 percent. And the reason for it is, of course, we want to use machine classification in e-cognition. This image, by the way, was taken by Parker. It's a survey company. This is another image related, very much related to the last month's talk. Uh, it's coral. And uh, both Lophelia and Paragorgia, the two uh, coral types you see here uh, on this image, they can grow down to uh, 1,000 to 3,000 meters. Not much light down there. Normally, the coral would like to have uh, down to 60 meters and have a nice light, but here they have that. I'm, what the, um, I'm, not a I'm not a marine biologist, so when we do work with them and do classify, and you see the classification at the bottom here, we work with the biologist to tell us what, how they want things to be mapped and how, what it has to be done. We help them to create rules that, that they can then run themselves. And what the biolog biologist said to me is they're not interested in the coral itself, but all the animals living inside it. So, and this was from guideline. Let's uh, go on to the next step talking about today's subject, which is um, handling of um, sonar data and machine learning. Some of you have maybe heard about deep learning. Um, deep learning is uh, something new. If you uh, Google it, you will get up a thousand web uh, pages immediately. I mean, it's, uh, it's the hot topic at the moment. And um, of course, well, everyone wants to use the latest and newest and best. We did not use deep learning on this one because uh, uh, if you're going to use deep learning, it takes 1,000 images for each class and calculate the object you have that you want to find and do a deep analysis on these self images. That's the, why the word is called deep learning, because you need, you need a huge amount of data sets. Google, with this huge amount of data, they, you can use up to 1 million images. So this is a huge challenge when you work with this new technology. You need a lot of data. Machine learning techniques is very similar. I mean, deep learning is a part of machine learning, but the machine learning we're going to talk about today, it combines your knowledge, your input data, and enough samples. And normally, when you uh, work with sonar data and map the seabed, you will be happy if you get a couple of hundred samples because they're very expensive to pick up. Um, and the other thing, if you put up a person with a master degree or a PhD degree, why not use your knowledge to find out what the best thing is? And sometimes we just uh, skip the, uh, uh, the machine learning and start with something simpler because uh, eCognition offers us a huge amount of tools to do the classification. And but the main trouble with this new stuff called deep learning is, do you have 1,000 samples of each class? I assume not. Not yet. It will come, but until then, we can use uh, what we have. When you start up, uh, I thought I was trying to play a sound for you um, from the sonar. Uh, I'll just skip that point. but. You have your uh, AUV or RUV or your uh, boat that goes over the seabed and send up uh, sound signals, which is returned to the um, uh, to the antenna, picked up, and you calculate. And from that sound signal, we can create this analysis. What you see here is a uh, 760 square kilometer, which covers up a six gigabyte of data. This is not a not a large uh, data set. Actually, we can uh, use a lot more. So, um, recognition can process this very quickly. But it takes you know for doing this survey by hand, it takes you maybe three or four weeks, and within recognition you would do it uh, probably within half a day. 
Okay, here comes the sonar. The steps we go through is a uh, data ingest, which means taking data into the uh, to the computer. We do some preparation, we go through that, and then we have control. Like we had with imagery, because very often you don't see very much, and it's very difficult to go down with a diver to see what's on the sea but You need to do control in a good way. Then you set up the data model, we add sample data, and then the last step will be to do process classification. By going through these steps now, showing you what we're doing. First of all, a little bit about eCognition as a software we uh, tool. Um, I mean, we have been using this software for 20 years, and uh, the way we sell it to customers is we train them, we help them building applications, and we help them run the solution. It's very advanced, and some people think it's uh, complicated to learn, and yes, it is, and that's why it's so good. And it has machine learning and deep learning routines. And for those of you who knows a little bit about deep learning, we have a Google TensorFlow as a version inside eCognition. This has become uh, not a default, but one of the best solutions for deep learning on the market. And with a huge amount of images in uh, Google, they have developed some really brilliant algorithms that we can use. The other thing is eCognition is being used by uh, major survey companies around the world. I just mentioned some uh, you already heard about. Norwegian Geological Survey, CFAS in UK. Then we have Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Uh, for the international and American community, we know we have USGS, uh, that means US Geological Survey, US Forest Survey, and then we have Norwegian Institute for Bioeconomy, which is a forest survey. And I just want to mention the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. They do a brilliant work on seabed mapping, and they also use our um, routines in eCognition for this work. So they have a lot of uh, articles you can Google. Beside that, we have an internet community with more than 12,000 members. We have inside the eCognition community, and several of those are research institutes of excellence. The good part of this is you will find many videos, many rule sets. If you're stuck with how to do things, you go to the community and you find a solution and you find someone to talk to and you find a way out. Geographic data you can work with uh, in eCognition is raster vector, and point clouds. I mean, that's the main source we uh, use in GIS. And that's why we have to convert your soundings to a raster before we can do it input. And since an advanced solution, we found you can always create a solution in eCognition. I've never, in these 20 years, I've never been stuck in any way trying to find a way out to classify images. Very short, briefly, about what, what it does, so you can have an overview before we go into details. The input is raster, vector, point clouds, and the raster will be uh, sonar data as raster, could be satellite images, could be drone data, could be uh, AUV data from the seabed or ROV data. Any image data in raster format can go in here. And as you see with the raster data, it doesn't have to be a picture. It could be different types of bathymetry, DTMs, etc. cetera. Uh, we can have uh, up to 160 layers in for those of you who work with uh, hyperspectral data. The first step when we get this data in is to time, we find, we need to find the object here. The first thing we do is to create segmentation on this is a key secret in eCognition. I think what the only thing we would call a black box, because it's uh, that's how um, they started up 
e-cognition by building these routines, and it's really working excellent. What it does is create uh, polygons or objects which are uh, homogeneous. You see this uh, grass area here? That's one grass area because it's one object, because you found it's homogeneous, in course, uh, due to the um, grass image. And we have buildings, we have roads, etc. Now, when you created this object, we uh, have routines to classify them, which we go through. And when you classify them, you get buildings, you get uh, forest, you get grass, you get uh, bushes, etc. And of course, you can't deliver this to your customers, so you want to do something better. But part of the classification is there some very advanced routines where you can have different levels of information. This could be your polygon you want to have. Then you can have a super polygon, and you can have sub polygons. So let's take uh, for its example, this is your forest stand. This could be properties or um, area codes. And this here could be a sub departments of that forest stand with different species. So this is how it can analyze and kind of go through all these hundreds and hundreds of functions. But I tell you, that's a lot of them. When you clean up, of course, we want the building to be uh, have uh, good of uh, rectangles. And also, when we create a nice polygon out, you want them to look good. Because at the end, you're going to sell this data to the end user, either in your organization or to someone who's paying you, and you want things to look good. And e-cognition does this in a good way. And the result can be exported as a raster again. You can import that into any GIS you have. Or you can deliver point loads. And also very important, we can export to Vexel. The export re report routines in e-cognition are uh, brilliant. If you have 200,000 images you classify, you can have e-cognition to uh, put out to one directory those images, 200 images of the 200,000 that contains what you're looking for. So you don't have to go through and scroll the whole uh, database. There really, really a lot of brilliant functions here. OK, let's go down to basics and what you're here to uh, listen to today. As I mentioned, we cannot work with this uh, sonar um, sound data. We need them to be created as um, backscatter and bathymetry. That's the input to these uh, algorithms. If you look here, there's a large uh, area. And you can see the, um, actually, you can see the boat has been going, the stripes here. And you have the soundings to each side. So the, this is the backscatter. And the other one is the bathymetry. And bathymetry from sonar is really uh, uh, very high quality, because that's something what uh, the sonar does well. Positioning of each point is more complicated. This is very similar to radar. That uh, The depth is very uh, good, but the XY positioning is not always that quality. The next thing we want to have are samples. We're coming back to that, but that's the three uh, data sets we put into our model. Uh, backscatter, bathymetry, and samples. So the samples should be distributed ar uh, around the data sets. We know some people uh, have a good knowledge on what to do. And we'll come back to how we can avoid using samples. But I think samples are good for two things. First, you want to use it as a training data set for your classification. The other thing is we uh, often need that to verify that the classification has gone correctly. The uh, data sets we get uh, backscatter and bathymetry. We uh, can use that directly, but sometimes it's good to uh, create some extra, extra derivatives we can use for the processing. We got something called rugosity, which is a 
the horizontal area divided by the um, uh, uh, terrain area. We got something called BPI, a geometric position index. <clears throat> I have a slide for that because I think rugosity and BPI is um, maybe new to someone. Aspect is, I guess most people have seen aspect images either on Google or other places, is more the direct direction uh, we're looking at. And BPI can come in, in uh, many variations. So in summary, when we do the classification, input to the data classification will be a DTM, bactymetry. Maybe uh, you need to do some filtering. We got roughness for backscatter and bathymetry, rugosity in many sciences, northness, which is the same as aspect, more or less. We got slope, we got BPI, many sciences. And if you got other data, we can include that as well. In our model, we don't uh, exclude anyone. We're, we're very open minded and liberal people, so we allow everyone to come in. Any data you have, that can help us classify, we use it. A little bit about BPI. I think it's a very interesting uh, feature to use. BPI is, doesn't say how flat the terrain is, but it's more like it's linear. If you look at, if you look at this one saying equal to zero, and you look at the terrain coming up here, you see it's, um, it's not flat, but it's linear. It doesn't change much. And so that's then BPI comes zero. And if you see, if you have a bump up here, the PPI will be above zero. And if you have a bottom like here, you will have BPI less than zero. Less than zero here, here's up and equal to zero. So the way we calculate is not very difficult. I think we have a raster. Uh, we take the central pixel. That's what you calculate the BPI for. We say that plus one. Then we subtract the average value of the pixels around. Here we got a three by three uh, solution. So um, we uh, multiply by minus one divided by eight for all the pixels around. When you summarize, we can either get zero or above zero or below zero. So this is what you call the position index. So it tells us how bump the terrain is, and we're going to come back to how we can use it. Rugosity is similar. It compares the flat area with the curved area. So there are two ways telling the same thing, but some people like to have rugosity, and someone want to use a BPI, and someone use, want both things. So we're done now. We have an automatic process to do this work. We uh, take the data in. We create these extra layers uh, called BPI and slope and all this. And everything is done in e-cognition now. And for those who were in Winchester in um, 2016, uh, you could see that it was taken out of uh, e-cognition and done somewhere else. But now we include everything with the rule set in e-cognition. Just press a button and it comes out uh, the layers you want to work with. Then you have control because when you classify, you're depending on the right data set. Here we look at the um, backscatter roughness. Um, and you see here, when you look at the backscatter, you can see the boat is going here. Uh, all these stripes are the boat going. You would want, you don't want to use that. So you look at, do I have my samples straight under the boat? Maybe you want, don't want to use those samples. And maybe you want to put the data back to the uh, survey company and say, well, listen, we got this stripe here. Is a way you can do something with the stripe so we get more uh, homogeneous data. Same thing with slope. Um, we have enhanced slope very much. So you can see um, down here is flat, but there's small curvatures. But obviously, you have some artifacts here. It's obviously uh, something coming from the way the data was captured. So if they're minor, you don't want to uh, worry about it. But if there are major uh, values here, 
you may be uh, want to look and do some filtering on your slope as well. And just check. So this is just checking. Um, and now we can use it. So we done checking. And then next step is to segmentation. Segmentation is creating polygons which are homogeneous. And how does a computer see the images? Well, it's a pile of numbers. These are three raster layers that are being used here for creating polygons. And it's just number crunching. Uh, no one knows what sort of numbers we have uh, in here. So we just process them. And this is the secret of e-cognition. It takes the layers you want in. And for here, for this project, we used bathymetry, slope, backscatter, backscatter standard deviation. But you decide, depending on the terrain you're working, and uh, what sort of things you want to look at, what sort of uh, layers you want to put in. Maybe you only want to use backscatter or backscatter standard deviation for your polygons, if that's the way you want to work. You decide, so our model, uh, just you just pick the layers you want to do for the processing. So when you create the polygons, why do we create the polygons? Because this object now has got the depth. We got backscatter values, which is the mean for the polygon. We got slope values, which are the mean for the polygon. And we got BPI 25, BPI 5. BPI 25 means we got 25 pixels out to each side. It means we're looking at a larger uh, area for uh, bumps. This is for smaller bumps, PPI5. Same thing with rugosity 5. Then you could ask peg and plus, plus, plus. In addition, since we have a polygon, the cognition calculates and we can use the size, you can use the shape, you can use neighbors, etc. So immediately when it comes into this model, we have a lot more information we can use for the processing, which is tremendous. Uh, I just added this slide because I know a lot of uh, people working on the seabed, I want to look at the texture and e-cognition has a huge amount of texture uh, algorithms you can use to do here. So if you look at texture after Haralik, if you uh, open some of them, you got homogeneity, then you got all direction, direction zero, 45, 90, and 135 means the uh, five, um, four main directions. So you see there's a huge amount of texture you can use uh, for your analysis if you want, if um, you have um, rules for that. The main thing for the classification when you have these data sets and your polygons, and the simplest way, of course, is to pick uh, samples on the bottom and you have a polygon, you want to link it to that uh, sample. So you get a shape file with the X position, Y position, and the class. So this could be some sort of coral, uh, could be a sand, could be a mud. Different way of doing this. Here you see from a Norwegian Marine Research Institute, they have a video grab. It means they have a grab, they take a sample, and they also have a video camera. So it's very good uh, for uh, collecting samples. But again, you see, this is quite expensive way to collect samples. So having 1,000 samples of each class doing this way is quite expensive. The classes you have is of your choice. So that's, of course, what you want to uh, find out. When we got, now we got our model. We have uh, your input layers. We have created polygons. So what we do, we take your sample database, which has one uh, point for each uh, sample, and one, and for one um, sample for each sample, we have a class. If you look here, which is quite obvious, um, in this area you have the blue polygons, which are most mud. This is bathymetry. So down there is, is at the bottom of uh, some area, so it's obviously a lot of mud. If you come up on the ridge here, we see it's more rock because it's uh, steeper here. So this now we connected 
the uh, samples to the um, polygons and then we can create uh, and do some uh, calculations and we say okay what's what sort of features would i want for my classification well the easiest thing is to uh, add a lot of them put them in and process because this is machine learning so we let the computer or actually ecognition to decide which of these features do we want to use do you have for those of you who statistics you can look upon uh, wikipedia and what the uh, ecognition does it uses um, the statistical methods for machine learning that's uh, presented in professional uh, the scientific magazines like base k nearest neighbor support vector machine decision tree random trees you can choose one of those uh, to work with these machine learning of course i just told you we're not we're not using deep learning in this uh, example here but this is also one of those you can use. So when you decide one of those, you can process it. It will take this data this, uh, for each polygon and calculate and see, okay, what of these features are key to this class? And this is a decision tree result. You come up, pop up here. You can see it uh, calculating and it go down here, you see, uh, Sandy mud or sand. It says if mean bathymetry is uh, less than so on, less a, that's a deep, uh, actually a deep area here with a lot of mud. So of course, bathymetry was a part of that. And also says if mean backscatter, etc. So it goes through and calculates all the things you put in and create a tree like this one. And it kicks out features that are not uh, uh, being used is being kicked out because uh, we don't need all of them. So this is this is how we train. And when we train, we just run classi classification. That's the simplest part. So it's actually the whole thing is actually not very complicated when you run it. We can also run large areas. Uh, we can split it up, tiling and stitching. We do modern computers with uh, hundreds, um, hundreds of uh, gigabytes of uh, memory. That's very um, needed, but it's possible to do that. I just mentioned that. So when we process each tile, get them out like this, and then we make um, e-cognition create one uh, super object from this one. In e-cognition, uh, when you work with large data sets, uh, like when you work with imagery like this one, uh, this is how we process a couple of hundred thousand images. We have what is called a server solution. So you can have many sonar data sets of the process, or you can have many images. You put them in a project like this one, and you say, run this rule set on all these images, and you start uh, processing. And then you can go on your web browser from home and look and see how is, this is going, and you can go back uh, next day and see the result so this is all automatic so this this works very well so the steps let's summarize we have the data ingest this is automatic it takes about five to 20 minutes depending on how good uh, well organized your data are um, so we uh, read it in we create the derivatives and all takes about from five to 20 minutes. The control part is difficult to say, but normally if you have a good uh, good routines, the control part is quite easy, but maybe take you half an hour to go through the data to look that it looks okay. But then you set up the model, add sample data and process, and it takes from five to 10 minutes. So it's actually taken me at least uh, two times longer to talk about the methodology than to actually run 760 square kilometers. And then when you process these data, that normally takes you three weeks to do manually. You can go do this in an hour and go for lunch. And this is the real life. 
Post-processing is something uh, we also have added as an automatic routines. You see here the black spots. Uh, you saw these when I showed you the uh, control data files under the ship. You see the black stripes here? They're under the ship. So what you want to do these is to fill them in so, because um, they don't want the black areas because there's no data. Here we uh, we have classified this thing and found uh, no value. So how do we do that? Well, we create a rule set in eCognition that fills the gap. Quite, quite easy. And this is also because we want to show it can be done automatically. Then we got a very nice uh, question from a survey company called Dove Subsea. They have a lot of coral out in the ocean they want to look at. Uh, they want to find the coral. They have sonar data. And as I mentioned, uh, this is on the, um, the these corals we're looking for are deep. It could be down to uh, maybe 200 meters down to uh, 3,000 meters. And it's difficult uh, to use camera uh, unless you have nowhere to go for it. So how do we find corals down there? Well, they told me, we uh, corals grow on, uh, there will be small bumps on larger bumps. So how do you find them in uh, using sonar data? Was actually quite a uh, nice way to show how we can use a BPI. Here we find, we use a BPI of 25 to analyze and find the large bumps. And then we used the uh, BPI-5 to find smaller bumps that are inside larger bumps. Uh, there were some control routines we added here. This is done automatically. And this is how we can automatically find a coral on um, sonar data. It's small bumps on uh, larger bumps on the seabed. And we can do this automatically. Of course, we would like to work with the uh, geologist and the um, biologist knowing exactly how they uh, look like. So we can just put in the parameters here. But when you presented this map to Dov Sepsi, they said, oh, OK, this is just what our uh, geologist worked with. And I said, yeah, we do this in five minutes. And they said, we do not. So this is a way you can really improve speed and quality in your work. The other thing uh, which is very common on the seabed mapping, especially when you're going to put in a telephone line or cable through a water, they're looking for oxals, unexploded ordnance. So we got uh, a map from uh, sonar data from uh, Norwegian Geological Survey, and they said, can you classify the oxals here? And oxals are metal, so they reflect quite well, so we found out there. Um, of course, it's not much that uh, you can see from it, but it is classified, though it's very obvious to be uh, axos and not rocks, not something else, because there is some, so much higher reflection on it. And because something that's, what do you call, almost uh, axos, but because of the size, we say it's not. So it's a simple way to uh, find out uh, the axos. OK. I think we actually managed this in a very uh, short time. And this is Norwegian. I said thank you for uh, uh, looking at us. And we are now open for some questions. Yes, Niels, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Um, always fascinating to see uh, the uses of e-cognition, uh, particularly uh, this is uh, a relatively young field in, in terms of e-cognition use and uh, very exciting stuff uh, going on out there. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the users? If Again, if uh, you want to submit a question, please use the, the questions dialog and um, and you can and we will we will field these. Um, in the meantime, um, Niels, I, I, I believe you, you you stated this. The one question came in here is: Is the data you you are using primarily is it from a, a ship on on the on the surface, or are they also collecting the sonar data, say from a submersible? Um, there was uh, there was some, uh, one question in this uh, direction. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, 
And I say, with well, there are different type of sonar data. You have, a, I, you know, it's a new industry for me, but you have got multi-beam, side scan, and they can be on the boat, like the boat you see on this picture. Uh, it could also be, have an ROV, that means small submarines um, that being towed, or it could be an AUV, which is a drone that goes by itself. Doesn't matter. Uh, I think it's important to real uh, to understand that for e-cognition, we don't care what sort of data you put in uh, here, uh, as long as it comes in the roster, we will classify and analyze, analyze it. And by the way, because I forgot to mention that, on the bottom of each slide, you see my mail address. So if you have some questions you forgot to ask, you can just send me a mail later. But I think it um, doesn't matter what sort of um, boat or submarine you're using. Uh, the sonar data comes in roster, and we, uh, we can work with that anytime. Great, excellent. Another question just came in here, uh, really specific to uh, the bathymetry derivative, derivatives that uh, you are generating with uh, with an e-cognition. Uh, how would you say these compare to uh, those uh, created with an algorithm from uh, a GIS, if, if you're familiar with, uh, with those procedures? Yeah, I, I think um, we've been thinking about that. And I think um, the GIS, you know, it's all about math. So we uh, we can present the calculation, and, and you may you may you may use your own uh, GIS for creating that. We also resolve for a comp or solution called the PCI, and we we can do it there. So a different. I mean, what we talk about is filtering, where you take the central pixel and and you either subtract or add the pixels around. This is uh, purely math, and most systems uh, can do that. What we did is we just um, created a rule set that automatically create these um, derivatives automatically. And it shouldn't matter if you want if you want to do it in your GIS, it doesn't matter because uh, we just put them in. But by putting them in the e-cognition, you don't, you don't have to go back and forward between software. Uh, the key thing is, if you someone look, work with uh, something called R or, or uh, S3 or whatever, if you have to jump back and forward when you're doing a process, it takes longer time. For scientists, uh, it doesn't matter very often because they spend too much, uh, so much time on uh, evaluating and controlling and calculating. But if you're gonna gonna make money on this one, you don't want to jump back and forward between uh, different. Uh, software if you don't have to then it's much better to just uh, have a one button solution but that's that's why we actually created it right i, th I think uh, it's also important to to note that uh, these formulas that we're using in e-cognition, there's a there's a, a quite a flexible algorithm uh, layer arithmetics that you can use to enter uh, any virtually any formula uh, that you want. So if you have a formula that you're coming out of a, a GIS environment from, you can transfer this uh, this formula into e-cognition. And like Neil said, you have the advantage of, of the full automated process within within the developer. Another question came in here uh, uh, in terms of, uh, do we know about uh, any routine to transform uh, polygon classes uh, to, so I assume a polygon, say, from a shapefile uh, to sample points uh, to perform a classification uh, within eCognition? And uh, Niels, if uh, I, I can I can field this one. Um, yep. Yes, it, it is possible if you're doing machine learning techniques, obviously uh, machine uh, learning uh, or supervised uh, learning uh, with and, and anything is, is based on uh, sample sample data. If you have this sample data in uh, a shape file, whether that's going to be a point shape file or in this case polygon, you can import this data into eCognition as, as what we call thematic uh, layer, and you can convert uh, the information uh, contained within this, uh, say, the sample shapefile into uh, then a sample, a sample data set that eCognition will utilize for the, uh, for the machine learning and in a training environment. So that, uh, that's a good, uh, good question and is a pretty um, uh, regular procedure uh, when working with an eCognition. Other questions we have here 
is um, one regarding a Google TensorFlow. Do you run a segmentation and then train it? How many samples do you need? Um, I, again, uh, I, can, I can jump in here. First of all, the, the uh, uh, convolutional neural network, that's, uh, that's what we're talking about here in terms of Google TensorFlow, deep learning. Um, it does not require any type of a, a segmentation or in this matter, in this case, uh, image objects. Uh, you can create, uh, even have eCognition um, automatically uh, search for the uh, sample objects, this can be, or the sample patches as they're called in, in, a, in a convolutional neural network. And the user can define how many samples uh, they would like uh, to create within eCognition. Um, how many samples do you need? Uh, this is, uh, uh, there's no definitive answer to this question. Uh, it will really range uh, or depend on, on your particular application, what you're happy with, the results you're getting. But uh, typically, convolutional neural networks, deep learning, they require more samples than, say, uh, your, your typical machine, uh, traditional tr machine learning techniques. Um, but it can range between uh, you know, several hundred uh, up to, uh, like Neil's already mentioned, uh, Google is using some deep learning techniques that uh, play off of millions of, uh, of samples. So that, uh, that's going to, to vary here. Um, let's see, okay. what else? To, yes, Neil, let's go ahead. I can just fill you in on a number of samples. According to Stanford University, who has been uh, uh, working on developing this methodology, they claim that the name deep learning means that you need a lot of images to teach, to be sure. And I think, uh, I think uh, what they say is that you need between 1,000 and 1,500 images for each class or object you want um, to find. That's uh, because of the way it's uh, learning. We have tried, we tried um, e-cognition, tens of love on some samples. Um, we had few samples and it, it was beautiful, wasn't it? excellent. But the problem was that we found a huge amount of false positives. So by going through 200,000 images, we found using the standard um, classification techniques in the cognition works better because we could reduce the number of false positives because we didn't have enough samples. So yeah, so it's a yeah. kind of trial there. Yeah, it's not only going to be the number of samples, but also it's also the quality of the samples as well. Um, it's always the, the famous computing phrase, garbage in, garbage out. But um, I think there's, there are some guidelines out there that, that you can use. Another question that just came in is regarding the uh, formulas or, or the rule sets uh, within eCognition, are they extensively documented? Uh, you'll find that any of the algorithms uh, or rules that are available within eCognition are, are well documented in the, the reference book and the user guide. And uh, as Niels already pointed out, uh, if, if, if you just um, don't understand maybe an explanation that's in one of these documents, there's plenty of places to go. There's an eCognition user community. Um, there's also our, our support portal for, for customers to write in, and uh, we can we can uh, try and provide you with a, a more uh, understandable answer if, if you have trouble uh, finding uh, those. Let's see, question in here. Um, What it was the image size, uh, and this is referring to pixel by pixels for the 1,000 to 1,500 Stanford, uh, so that, Niels, this was for you uh, in terms of the, the, the numbers you referenced there from Stanford. Um, what was the, the image size? I assume you, are you referring to the image size of the uh, sample patch uh, for the 1,000 to 1,500 uh, Stanford images. There was, do you have any information on that? No, but I think you know uh, that's one of the key uh, tricky things because uh, samples can be a uh, different uh, image size, and uh, but it must must be because what it looks for patterns, it looks for uh, variation in the image, and they have a lot of uh, black box in there too, where they actually uh, they take uh, the image apart and looking. Unless you're looking for a cat, we're well, looking for the ears, and then they find out what's what does a cat look like from uh, patterns and from lines and you know all sort of things? So it goes through a huge amount of uh, layers to the, find that. Uh, too complicated to go in here, but I think uh, trying uh, you should when you go to deep learning you should uh, try and look up uh, 
uh, on the internet, Google it, because uh, it varies a lot. And um, we're still in the beginning of deep learning and uh, a lot of things going on. And mainly it's been used for um, large object like faces, like um, objects like cats, hogs, horses, whatever. But also like in a pipeline, it's more like a physical object that you can um, create. If you go in, like the thing we looked at now, we're looking at the sea, but we just have backscatter and geometry. Um, there are no objects actually because the shape can be anything. So it's more like um, the texture and, and things like that we're looking for. So uh, I'm not sure how it works. I'm haven't worked enough with it to see how it is. And I haven't seen any example on uh, the internet using uh, bathymetry for deep learning, but we'll come, certainly. Yeah. Another question here, uh, kind of segueing into a, a different field of use was, can we use e-cognition for lithology classifications? And um, uh, here I would say, uh, if, if you have an image of, uh, of say the uh, geological image, whether it's going to be a scan of, uh, of a rock face, um, and if, if it's in a supported image format, you can load this in, into cognition. I know for, for, for a number of applications in, in the geological field that uh, use hyperspectral data, eCognition also supports hyperspectral data sets as long as it's in one of the, the supported image formats. Um, and as well as using uh, analyzing, say, uh, geological borings, if that's it's, uh, it's also falls into that category of lithology. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with the with the whole field uh, itself, uh, but these uh, can also uh, definitely be analyzed uh, within e-cognition. So uh, it's uh, very flexible in terms of uh, the use here. Another question in here, how user-friendly is the use of convolutional neural networks in e-cognition? Uh, excellent question. Um, I, would go as far to say this uh, from uh, the perspective of someone who's n I'm not in the position myself to uh, write any uh, Python uh, scripting and things of this nature, which has traditionally been uh, at least the, the background for TensorFlow, uh, Google TensorFlow models. Uh, we have uh, put the use of convolutional neural networks into a fairly uh, uh, I wouldn't go as far to say easy to use, but a, a, a user-friendly um, graphical user interface environment that uh, can be worked through uh, in, in, in time. Uh, and there's also a, a very nice tutorial available for free in the eCognition uh, community uh, devoted completely to how to use the convolutional neural network tools uh, inside eCognition, of course. So if you go into the eCognition community, simply search for convolutional neural networks or CNN, and uh, you will find this, uh, or you can contact support at eCognition.com, and uh, we can provide you with more information there. Hello, and this is Christian. I have also an additional comment uh, to the uh, how user-friendly is the convolutional neural network in eCognition. Here we're offering also uh, nice tools to create sample patches uh, very easily to train a neural network, convolutional neural network classifier. And this is, from my point of view, compared to some other tools, very user-friendly and helps customer really to um, train the uh, CNN models uh, easier. That's that's quite cool. Just an additional comment. I think we have time for just uh, two more questions. I have a one on queue here, and this is one I think Niels. Uh, well. Uh, definitely in, in your area. Uh, what is the difference between a sonar and a seism seismic uh, data set? Uh, and could uh, these be processed in e-cognition? Apologize if uh, for some of the experts out there, if it uh, seems uh, petty, but I will uh, we'll put that out there. I'm very happy just for this question because I prepared on the last for Seismic is, you know, going down, um, we just actually discussed the seismic with the old company yesterday. Um, and when they looked at the, um, the rule set, when we showed them the rule set uh, doing with the laboratory images, and you show them the texture and they say, okay, this is great for uh, seismic data. The seismic data comes in the roster and what they do is they, um, they take, uh, they get layers from seismic data, it's explained to me. 
So each layer can be uh, classified and you can look at the train at a certain time, uh, geological time. And yes, it should be uh, it should be doable to do. I never tried it myself, but according to what we discussed yesterday, I think it should be perfect to work with seismic data as well, as long as you can work with um, each seismic layer by itself. And then you can uh, put the seismic layers on top of each other and use, like we showed you in one of the slides, you can look at uh, something above and below and um, improve the classification. So the difference between seismic is uh, you got several layers down in, in the ground. Go, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not only the top, it's going down really down in the ground and, and you got several, it's more like LIDAR where you have uh, several returns. Um, so that's um, that, that's a good description. And then we can take each layer. By, by the sonar we talked about, which is a multi-beam and side scan, uh, you normally work with only one layer. So seismic is several layers and sonar is one layer. That's, that's a cheap uh, description. Great, thank you, Niels. Um, that being said, uh, that, will, that was our, our final question uh, for this session. If you have any other questions, please feel free to, to send those uh, directly to Niels. You have his, uh, his contact information here, or if there's question, general questions to eCognition, again, uh, you can send those to support at eCognition.com. Uh, that being said, uh, we I'd just like to make the announcement that um, next month's webinar uh, will be also on a, on a very interesting topic. We're going to be examining um, the use of, of analyzing multi-temporal satellite uh, data sets uh, to support the monitoring of refugee camps uh, throughout uh, the African sub-Saharan uh, regions. Uh, this presentation is, is going to be done by a partner university of ours, the University of Salzburg, and uh, to be more specific, the Zetkis uh, group there. And uh, please keep your eye on the, the geos, uh, Trimble Geospatial um, portal to register for this event. We'll also be sending out announcements. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like to attend that webinar as well, uh, please register when the time comes. And uh, that being said, uh, thank you, Niels, for, for the presentation and the, taking the time to, to answer answer the, and go through these questions and uh, thank all of you for for attending the webinar today and we hope to see you in the next session have a, a really good rest of your day and uh, see you soon